Welcome to today's webinar, Community of the Future, A New Experience, presented by Trestle Hospitality Concepts. We'd like to take this opportunity to give thanks to our sponsors for today's webinar. Hello Guard, Clark Food Service Equipment, and True North Management. So let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much. I'm Becky Smith from Clark Food Service Equipment, and I have the honor of partnering with Aaron Fish with Trestle Hospitality and Sanjeev Shetty from Hello Guard. And we're going to learn today about the community of a future, a new experience. This will give us the opportunity to take a day in the life of what it could be like to live in a community with heightened technology, and we're excited to share that with you all today. I'll be the moderator, and Aaron and Sanjeev will be filling us in with all of their knowledge from their experiences in senior living. So the first point is current trend impacting community experience. Then we'll touch on why technology is critical to community experience a journey into robotics, and a tour of the community of the future. So I'm going to let Aaron kick us off here with current trends. Thanks, Becky. We wanted to lay the groundwork. A lot of the information we're going to talk about with current trends is information that we've all been talking about. We wanted to provide some up-to-date information regarding uh, what these trends look like, what this information is currently, because it sets the stage for the conversation that we're going to have later about why technology and robotics and this community of the future is going to be something that we need to start talking about and doing now versus thinking about it two, three, four, five years down the road. And so as we talk about the current trends impacting this community experience, I want to focus in on three key areas that we, we all are aware of, but share some very specific things that I think will really paint the picture as to why these are so important and why the community of the future is going to help solve for what we think is these issues and how they're going to impact community experience. So we'll talk about staffing and workforce, recruiting and retention, and then about the shifting demographics. So as we think about the staffing and workforce in the senior living space, there's a whole lot going on. We know that there's been an ongoing struggle with finding staff, retaining staff, keeping them in place, but what does this really truly look like? Well, first and foremost, the annual turnover rate among senior living workers in 2022, which is the last time it was measured by Nick, was 85%. Now this encompasses all positions within the industry, and so that's a very significant number. I mean, if you're turning over 85% of your staff, that's a lot of work, you know, onboarding, training, development, and just relationship building that your residents and prospects are going to have to do. So it's a key factor in how we approach and what can we do to solve for that. The second thing that I think is important to note is understanding where we're at with the workforce we know that employees are more productive when they're happy at work. 67% of employees have shared that with a Gallup poll. And the reason that's so important is that the relationships that are built and how those impact the senior living community experience is really valuable. And it's important to note that we've got to find ways to keep employees happy, not only for retention, but also for resident uh, and customer satisfaction. And what we have found, especially in kind of transitioning into the uh, younger millennial and Gen Z population of the workforce, is that they want purpose. And we know that senior living provides purpose. And being able to have those relationships build is going to increase our workforce happiness. So it's obviously a key factor in how we want to approach this. And then the last piece of data that's really important to share is as of March of this year, we still have 70% of our assisted living operators that are reporting a significant or severe workforce shortage. And that comes from leading age. And that number increases actually to 92% when we talk about skilled nursing. So there is definitely a huge issue and opportunity here to figure out how do we solve this workforce shortage? Because 
it's not something that's going to continue uh, to improve. So we need to figure out other ways and start getting creative to addressing that workforce shortage. Another piece of the puzzle is understanding the financials behind this. PHI did a state of the workforce report earlier this year. And given how we are currently managing our workforce, the result of this is that the median annual earnings for direct care workers is just short of $24,000. And so we know that that's not going to attract our ideal employees. So what can we do to take this number and increase it to help get there where those high quality workers will want to be a part of the industry without having a significant impact on the bottom line of your operations? So this community of the future can start to address some of these issues and some of these data points that we see. So what's coming our way, right? Well, there's not going to be enough caregivers. So Leading Age did a report and they found that the caregiver support ratio between 2016 and 2060, which is a huge time frame, but this is when our industry is going to grow the most, is going to go from 31 people to 12 people for every adult over the age of 85. So in addition to having a current workforce shortage and having struggles with staffing, it is only going to get exacerbated by these numbers. As they looked at these figures and they started really figuring out what's going to be this impact on long-term care, well, there's going to be a shortage of direct care people of 9.3 million. And that's only in direct care. So we're not talking about the ancillary positions and what does that look like? It could become more dire if we don't start addressing how can we be creative in, a, in focusing on improving the workforce and developing the workforce the way we want it to. Um, PHI had some more information just to kind of give you an idea of, of what this job growth needs and looks like. And this is simply just within um, the next few years. And so we're talking about needing an additional, you know, 1.2, 1.4 million openings filled by 2031. So again, we see this coming that we don't want to have a deer in the headlights look at this approach to this. So what can we do? What are some things to understand on being able to recruit and retain these individuals so that way we can be successful? Well, obviously, you know, this is some statistics around recruitment and retention. So what are some of the top job attributes that our people are looking for? Well, obviously they're looking for good wages, right? We already talked about the numbers um, around salary. So we've got to find a way to improve those. Um, stable position. So how can we not have that high turnover, not just for the worker, but for the work environment? If someone comes in and they're constantly jumping positions and having to cover shifts because of turnover, that's not creating that stable job that they're looking for. And then lastly, I think one that's important to point out is this feeling valued and respected. You know, it's at 33%, which may seem low, but we know as we evolve the, the generation that is working in the workforce and it shifts into this younger demographic, that's going to increase. That's going to go higher and higher as part of that. You can see here that same Gallup poll I referenced earlier Fun is the number one driver of well-being for every generation. And you can see as they're looking at where they want to be, they want to have more joy and more fun at work. 60% of employees who are happy with their work-life balance will stay put. So if we can stabilize what our workforce looks like, if we can create good paying jobs that have a lot of resident interaction and can create that personal feeling of value, for the workforce, we're definitely going to be able to recruit and retain the right people to be working in our space. So real quickly, I want to kind of also look at the shifting demographics. And so these aren't new numbers, but again, we I feel that it's something we want to share and just kind of go through, you know, we're looking at 
the average age of a of, of a senior living and senior living is between 81 and 83 years old, right? And so as we think about our population growing, you can see the 18 to 64 and 65 and older groups, they're kind of growing at a, an expected rate, right? But as we get into that age of seniors we're going to be serving, there's going to be a huge explosion, right? And so we need to be prepared for that, knowing that we have a workforce that is shrinking, but we have a population of, of customers that's going to be growing very significantly. And so this kind of gives us a little bit more understanding about what these demographics look like. Older adults are going to outnumber older children for the first time in over 100 years. The education level of our population is significantly higher. You know, 28% in 1970 had completed a high school diploma. In 2020, that number is 89%. And so all of these kind of shifting demographics is going to be really important to understand. And this last one is the, the older consumers supporting the economy number, right? We know that they're going to spin. They'll have resources to pump into the economy. And so there are opportunities there with how we do programming and, and services that can help us grow our bottom lines if we're very strategic about the way we approach it. So kind of as we wrap up this portion on trends, the, the big question is, what is the demographic impact on senior living overall? How do we summarize this? Well, we need to understand what's the impact on our incoming residents, right? We, we know that we need to improve services. We need to talk about those expectations. Um, for our current residents, what are we doing? How are we solving the workforce crisis now? They're experiencing that in the communities. So how do we start to fix that and provide some immediate support for that? And then lastly, our employees, right? We want to retain them. We want to make sure we're able to pay them good wages. And so understanding some of these impacts on the senior living space is really going to allow us to better understand that. So let's talk a little bit of, about why technology is going to be critical to the community experience, because the community experience is evolving, as we can tell, as we know um, what we're hearing from residents and what we're hearing from prospects. And we know that technology is going to be a solution that we have to have. And so let's talk a little bit about that and let's kind of understand the value that we're trying to create. So with our prospects expectations. So now we're kind of talking about what are the new residents moving in? Because we need to start building programs and community experiences for these prospects, right? Our current residents will benefit from that, but the ones that are coming in in the next 18 to 24 months, those are the ones we need to be preparing for and getting ready for. Because that 2023 to 2025 timeframe that's when the real explosion of the demographics is going to happen for us. So just a few things to note about what our prospects are expecting. First of all, they're really looking for more food service options, a variety of those. The days of one big dining room of 120 seats where you come, sit down at 8, 12, and 5, those days are long gone. Even if you're doing that now, you know that you're probably struggling with prospects that are looking for different, especially those adult children. The second is the elevated resident engagement experience. We have talked as an industry so much about how can we evolve what we're doing for our residents? How do we go from bingo and book clubs into things that our residents really truly want as far as engagement? How can we bring those elevated experiences to them? so that they can have a better holistic person-centered approach to their engagement. And then the last thing that I think is gonna be key is the value that we're bringing. So we talk about needing to increase food service options and provide more programming and increase the amount of, of that, the healthcare services we do, but we can't raise our rates exponentially to cover those. So we have to find ways to create more value for those residents 
and be able to experience these things all at the same time. And so it's going to be a delicate balance of strategic planning and financial management and understanding your market that's really going to kind of drive what these look like. Sanjeev, do you want to talk about high tech, high touch? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. When I think about technology and robotics specifically, the first question I get asked is, okay, so are we going to get rid of humans? And uh, obviously the answer is no. So the idea is not to re replace the human experience. If you look at the senior living industry, there is a lot of touch points and it's very personalized. And the way I look at this is that technology and robotics really helps elevate the number of touch points. And this gets uh, really, uh, when you look at person-centered approach, there's so many elements of it, things like empathy and listening and bringing in the family, making joint, joint decisions. I, I see robotics and technology really playing a big role in this. And the whole idea behind high-tech, high-touch is to really elevate the experience using technology and leveraging robotics to actually elevate that personalized experience. So let's just take an example. So involving the family and friends, you can use robotics to do that. The other way I look at this is if we were to use technology and specifically robotics, you're taking away some of those routine mundane tasks that people, first of all, may not like to do. And we're giving them back that time to actually allow them to do more value added tasks. So let's take an example of that. So if you look at housekeeping, for instance, right? If you ask someone, hey, would you rather go to the second and third floor and vacuum carpets? Usually the answer is no. Or would you rather maybe do something more value added, like maybe cleaning medical devices or doing laundry for the residents? Same thing goes for cleaning tiles. I mean, there's robots to do that. So the way I look at high tech, high touch is really in three areas. It's not to replace the human experience, but to elevate that human experience by giving back the time that they want and can use towards higher touch points. Uh, I think it also amplifies or improves the person-centered approach that you already may have in place. And then the third one, we use this a lot in our uh, sales pitch is the force multiplier, is that robots really allow you to multiply and add more time to your existing staff so they can be more efficient with the use of their time. So that's the whole idea behind high tech, high touch. Yeah, great points. I couldn't agree more with what you're saying, Sanjeev. So let's talk about a journey into robotics because from my vantage point in talking to operators and, and working with operators, the this can seem like it's hard to overcome or there's a lot of concerns about how does this work. And I, I think Sanjeev can kind of walk us through and really kind of take some blinders off and really open up what this looks like for us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different things. So obviously you've got sort of the economic shift that we we heard a little bit about from Aaron with what I call as sort of the trifecta effect going on. You've got inflation and rising wages. You've got the labor shortage. And then of course you've got the attrition. And it's like the perfect storm that that is brewing here. And it's only going to get worse before it gets better. So you got the economic sort of what I call as a macro shift happening. And then you also have this evolution that's going on within senior living. So if we were to break down senior living into four different eras, let's just say senior living 1.0 was the era where everyone was racing to get electronic health record systems back in the late 90s and early 2000s. And that happened for about a decade. And that cropped up a lot of different EHR platforms. If you look at senior living 2.0, everyone was racing to go to the cloud and get rid of data centers because it was too expensive to maintain. And a lot of folks didn't have uh, big IT departments in house. So that was sort of the next uh, phase of senior living. And then uh, COVID-19 hit right around 2020. And there was sort of this fundamental shift in the way senior living operated because it really made you rethink a lot of different things, starting with just the basics, right? Your infrastructure, everything from Wi-Fi to your basic amenities when it comes to technology, all of that had to be upgraded so you could bring in family members into the, the buildings. And as a result of that, I see sort of the senior living 4.0 being 
really focused around staffing and the labor issue. And I kind of saw this in my own personal journey because I spent the first part of my journey in senior living really working at a provider on various different looking innovative technologies. And the one thing that became clear to me was that there wasn't a solid engagement platform. So I went to work for an engagement tech company. And when I got there, the first question is, well, who, who do you integrate with? And I realized that we really needed good integration solutions. So I went and ran an integration company for two years. And when I started selling an integration product, the first question that came up is, hey, I'm in pain. I don't have labor. How are you going to solve for that? And don't come back to me until you've solved for that. So that's when I realized that we really need a, a robotics uh, solution. But when I say robotics, I don't mean like actual robots, but I mean robotics as a service to help automate a lot of the workflow that's going on within senior living. So a lot of people ask me, why robotics? And I would say robots are just a tool in my toolbox. I see ourselves more as a workflow automation company and robots just happen to be part of that, um, the tool that I use to automate that workflow. So the driving factors behind this journey into creating FlowGuard was really sort of a combination of what I deemed from the industry, from listening and talking to individuals on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what makes us unique is that we don't just throw a robot and say goodbye. We actually listen to the, to the challenge. We help communities and operators adopt the robots, so it's actually performing tasks and solving for that challenge. And then we walk them through a very simple ROI model uh, to ensure that they're getting value out of the robot and out of our service. So it's really sort of bringing robotics to the industry, but making it work within the realm of where the challenges truly exist. So for example, if you just take house keeping, for instance, we have a very simple ROI calculator that says, hey, how many square footage are your folks cleaning every day? How many folks do you have assigned to it? What kind of hourly salary are you paying them? And then we come up with an ROI calculator based on our cleaning robots and the efficiencies they can bring. And that way, you know, your housekeeping folks could be doing certain other higher value tasks uh, rather than doing the repetitive cleaning uh, tasks that, they, that they're used to doing. And then the same thing goes for dining or on the healthcare side as well. So that's the way we justify the cost. Hope that helped, Aaron. It does. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about RAS. This is a concept that you and I talked about as we started putting the webinar together that I think will intrigue our attendees. Yeah, so RAS is a, a term that I coined and now it's being used very commonly in the, in the robotics industry. And it really stands for robotics as a service. And it's basically a financial model that allows you to adopt ro robots within your operation without having to put out a huge capital outlay. And that really plays to sort of your return on investment. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of operators who, who don't want to put out a lot of uh, capital dollars towards an investment that they can't really see an ROI on. And of course, there's a flip side where people have deep pockets and they depreciate an asset over five years and they're good with that model. But I think the whole idea of RAS is to offer the flexibility of financing for, a, for an asset that you know there isn't a very clear ROI on. So you can actually put in your, your maintenance, your support and all of that and you can lease a robot rather than purchase it up front. And that way you have more flexibility with the financing terms over a period of time. And you can actually see the value and the tasks that are being done uh, over the period of that lease. So it's really, it's a win-win situation. You know, us as a company, we, we see smaller payments but over a longer period of time. And for the operator, it's, it's a flexible way to purchase an asset where you wouldn't typically have the capital dollars to do it. Perfect. And then I'd love for you to talk about what you see as the three core buckets. Yeah. So if you really distill senior living down, there's kind of three 
main areas, I would call it. And of course, these come up in your P&L. You've got sort of the core operations, which is just the running of the community. So things like grounds and housekeeping and ensuring that the mail gets delivered and the front office operations and the back office operations. And then you've got obviously the healthcare piece, taking care of folks in the assisted living and skilled nursing facilities and everything that goes along with that, including the regulation and, and the nurses and the doctors, et cetera. And then you've got the dining piece, which is, believe it or not, usually is the second largest uh, P&L item on your, on your operating side. So that's how I would break down senior living into those very three broad buckets. And we see ourselves helping in each of these areas. So for example, if you take the core operations, we have robots. And by the way, we have 24 different robots. It seems like a lot, but they all do different things. And the idea behind that is to really be flexible and adapt to the challenges that come up. And we don't believe in being a one-trick pony, or we don't believe that one robot solves everything. And in fact, not all of the robots uh, solve all of the challenges, but wherever there's pain, we see our robots coming in. From an operations perspective, it's mainly on the cleaning side. We have a scrubber and a vacuum that's very efficient. It's the only one in the industry that has a 3D LiDAR. Uh, on the healthcare side, uh, we're building out a virtual care companion, which we think is going to add a lot of value especially with the nurse shortage right now. And on the dining side, we have uh, both indoor and outdoor delivery uh, for food, and we are completely integrated with uh, the major elevator companies. So we really look at ourselves as a one-stop shop for all your robotic needs that may come up in these three buckets. Yeah, I think having that variety of the different robots that provide those different services. I know when you had mentioned you had robots that do delivery to like cottages. There are a lot of operators that are developing assisted living communities with that IL component. And that's a great support for them to be able to take care of that. So. Yeah. And it really is. And we deliberately went after the best of breed robots because we believe that unless you have the best solution out there, no one's going to adopt it. And I'll give you an example. If you look at the outdoor delivery robot space, there's so many players in that market but we're the only ones that have multiple compartments and that are truly autonomous. So if you look at 99% of the outdoor robots, someone has to actually drive those robots. <laughs> and you're not really lowering your labor costs by having that model. So we're the one of the only ones out there that have truly autonomous robots uh, that can go on snow, on rain, they can move like crabs sideways and uh, can navigate all kinds of terrain. So um, we're really proud of that. With all of that said, and I think there's a, a couple of main points that stood out with me, the fun aspect, right? And the value aspect, but painting the picture through the demographics of where senior living has been and where it's going, the labor shortage, I think what our prospects and our community members are expecting. And I know it's just always easier to fully grasp something when we're able to picture it and understand all of the components, but when you look at all of the opportunities for robotics and technology through our core operations, dining and healthcare, I think there's been a, a lot more advertisement and excitement around seeing them in the dining operation, but it really is astounding. All of the things that HelloGuard has and all of the technology that's out there now in terms of everything around a community. And so why don't we paint the picture for the audience and for ourselves and look through what is a day in the life of a resident and how does that feel and what differences does that make in their experience? What difference does that make in their family members experience? And not to mention the, the supplemental workforce that this will allow us to have when we know we're going to need to have some sort of bridge to fill that gap down the road. So let's run through a day in the life. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're right, Becky. I think this is probably going to be my favorite part of the webinar because I think we're going to be able to, between the three of us, really let our attendees see just what we're talking about as far as what you said and how it can apply. And so let's just imagine that you are in the senior living. We are going to follow a resident throughout the day. And so 
very first thing in the morning, we've got 7.45. This is when the resident likes to wake up. And so they're in their room, they're waking up, and they're getting their breakfast served to them. Some of the great things about technology and integrating it is that we're not just talking about robotics. Sanjeev is an expert in that, but he's also realized that it's a holistic approach. It's got to be person-centered. And so imagine Betty waking up and she gets goes and opens the door and there is uh, the, the, the Timmy robot ready to deliver uh, breakfast and provide the med reminder. Um, as she's waking up, you get uh, a circadian lighting system that is set to her unique routines and it starts to bring the lights up. So that way she can go from the, the, the nighttime sleeping environment to more of a bright and alert environment in her apartment. And then lastly, and I'd love CNG for you to talk a little bit more about how this works, but we can monitor vitals with wearable tech and transmit that through some of your systems. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we we see the wearables being a big part of technology um, in a community. And obviously wearables come in many different forms. Some come as some look like watches, like obviously you got the Apple Watch and um, some look like bands and you even got patches now. In fact, uh, we were talking to a partner the other day that has a little Band-Aid size. It's not a, actually a patch because patches need to be replaced, but this actually attaches to your chest and does a continuous EKG mm. and that can be transmitted to the robot. So if there's any changes or things that look out of place, the robot can actually be alerted and maybe call someone to uh, take action. And, and I love the thing that it's this resident is experiencing one robotic unit, but it's doing multiple things, right? It's queuing the lighting system. It's taking the vital readings and ta-da, there's that elevated service of here's your breakfast. So we know your preference is eating in your room versus going to the dining room. So we've already started the day off with a number of tech, tech touch points and we're just now getting started. So next point, after you've gotten through your initial morning, I think one of the really neat things is activities to a whole new level. So this VR experience, I think, is absolutely state-of-the-art, being able to experience what it's like to be in Italy or walk down a road somewhere, a roller coaster ride, all of these things that you aren't necessarily able to do. You're able to really experience those in real life. And, and Sanjeev, how is that sort of revolutionize the, the activities, departments, and member and community experience? I think VR offers so many benefits, and we could spend, you know, a whole <laughs> day on this topic, but we were fortunate that we had a really good VR partner who develops content for senior living, um, and we are able to provide that content through VR experiences. And there's clinical science behind all the benefits of VR. I mean, I was at a brain health conference yesterday up in the hill in DC, and people were talking about how the cost of brain-related conditions like Alzheimer's and dementia is the cost of healthcare. And, and VR, I see as one of those tools that can help sort of invoke the brain and actually help people get better experiences, but it can be used in so many different ways not just for residents to go see Paris or do skydiving or maybe watch a movie, but it can also be used in other parts of the community. We talked about employee experiences and delighting the employees and getting them involved and happy with uh, some of the technologies that could be used there as well. But in this particular case, I mean, I see residents using VR to to have that experience and maybe invoke some feelings that that they can't normally get. So if they want to visit the local church, for instance, or visit the local zoo, they can do that through VR now. Yeah, it's such a great experience and so many people creating experiences around that. So Betty has obviously gotten her day off to a, a crazy fun start. And so it's lunchtime. She is on her way to lunch. And this is one of those kind of in passing moments that a lot of people don't really think about when they think about the experience. But on Betty's way to lunch, she just happens to stumble across a Cenobot SP50, which is doing just what Sanjeev had mentioned. It is doing all of the vacuuming and cleaning 
So that way the housekeeper or the caregiver can really kind of create more of that human connection and assist the resident and not be worried about vacuuming. And so this is a brief passing moment, but it's kind of, as you think about life in this community, this is the kind of thing that residents will see and experience and understand that, hey, this is letting the people that I come to see every day that work here and support me, I get to spend more time with them because of a unit like this. And so it doesn't become a weird foreign thing. It's just part of the day. So that way we can be successful. Yeah. And what's cool about these robots is that uh, it does uh, something called spot cleaning. So if it's going around doing its rounds and cleaning the carpets and it sees that there's a candy wrapper in the middle of the hallway, it actually goes out of its way because it's got this cool NVIDIA AI chip built into it and it's got this 3D LiDAR. So it goes out of its way, goes, picks up that wrap, wrapper as opposed to waiting for someone to pick it up six hours later, right? Yeah. Becky, as we go into the next activity, I just want to mention Christy Christine dro dropped a note in the Q&A loving all of this, but she's concerned about the socialization and the human connections. And I think this is probably the first real activity where I think this comes into play. So I'd love for you to walk us through what this means, what that looks like, so that Christy is a little less concerned about the socialization aspect. Yeah, so I think anytime you have robots, I think you've got to incorporate some of that socialization aspect to it. So for example, if you're delivering lunch or a drink or a meal, maybe you could have it playing music or maybe have a family member out there greeting that resident or singing happy birthday at the table. So you can always include the socialization aspect into the experience. And this is where I go back to my high tech, high touch. It can't just be a utilitarian tool that just goes and delivers food. It's actually socializing with the residents. So we have done things like you could uh, incorporate it into, let's say, what's bingo night or you're playing some interactive games. You could have the robot being the host one day, or you could have interactive experiences built onto the robot. Uh, this is where I go back to, you've got to have a very high touch personalized experience to go along with the robots. And that's what adds to the socialization aspect of these devices. So we can certainly do that with all of our robots that are out there. Just to add to that too, I mean, the reason for that is this is allowing that personal touch to still be there. This is keeping the servers on the floor. They're able to still interact with all of the residents. And this is just taking a level away. They're able to deliver items and bus items, those points that aren't necessarily high touch. So the robots are, are taking that off of the plate of the actual server so the servers can interact more with the residents. And I think that's kind of the point of still having that personal interaction and so not necessarily taking that away. Yeah, that, you bring up a great point there, Becky. And I, I actually think that having the robots there allows the servers to be more interactive than less interactive with the residents because to your point, it can take away some of that busing activity. So they're not spending most of their time going in and out of the kitchen. They could actually be there talking to the residents, understanding how the meal is, if there's any improvements that they can make. And so Absolutely. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I know that it's 30 to 40% of a server's time in a traditional setting is on those trips to the kitchen and being in the back of the house. And if we can eliminate the steps, we improve the job in general for that person. And it becomes like instead of 50, 60% on the floor, now we're at 80%. And that's time that residents want for those conversations and those interactions. So just having that robot in the dining room is definitely going to be an exciting experience. So we obviously, you know, we were talking about health and wellness early on. You know, CNG was pointing out how this is a person-centered approach. We also know that this younger demographic of residents that are going to be coming in are going to be more active. They've got more interest. So at 1.30 in the afternoon, Betty is going to her yoga class. And how great would it be for the instructor to be walking around and really helping residents with getting their poses right, supporting all of the different levels of experience and capabilities. 
as opposed to Betty needs a towel and some water and I need to get this resident uh, a towel or I need to get this person this. And so having a, a robot in the yoga class offering water and towels and just going back and forth between residents as they're doing their different poses, being able to have that as an offering. Again, how do we enhance that human element, the human experience that Sanjeev pointed out? This is another way where that instructor is spending more quality time with the resident than not. Same thing with the package delivery. You're keeping the concierge or the front desk staff there so that they can greet the residents as they're coming in and out. Prospects are able to see that someone's actually in the entryway. So the robots being able to deliver the packages and, and really kind of take that, that heavy lifting off of the actual staff's plate, I think is essential. Yeah, that's exactly right. How many times have you seen the main room, mail room being inundated with Amazon packets and FedEx packages and not to mention the mail? This is just taking the burden off that front desk person so they can spend more time greeting residents, just being there at the front of the desk as opposed to sending packages uh, to the rooms or getting out of the front desk. So, yeah. And this is one that uh, really intrigues me, right? Because Again, this the, Betty is very concerned about her well-being, right? She's in this community because she wants support. Um, so diet and nutrition is very important to, to Betty. And so how can she get that support? But again, we're talking about a limited workforce as we go forward. And are we going to have an, enough uh, people? Are we able to have a dietitian in every single assisted living community uh, across the country? The answer to that shortly is no, but with a community of the future approach using technology the right way, you can have an in-person, high-touch, high-tech approach when it comes to things like a registered dietitian consultation. Yes, that's absolutely right. And we all know how important food is in a senior living community and how a, a good diet can also help in the overall wellness uh, of the residents. So this is yeah. certainly where technology can play a huge role. Well, and CNG, you had mentioned that this is something that you guys are currently working on yes. as a service with part of the, your, your robotics as a service. That's right. We're actually incorporating some uh, diet apps into our ro robots so you mm -hmm. can bring in those dietitians into the room and have those live consults. And this goes back to what I was talking about with brain health and how food is has to be treated as a uh, as medicine and having the right diet is so key and so important. Everyone's paying attention to food right now. So I think that uh, having this capability integrated with robots really does add value in the room and outside as well. Absolutely. So this next one is a fun one, Becky, but one of the biggest things that we worry about is all of the back of the house downtime that our resident engagement directors spend not engaging with residents. So talk to us a little bit about happy hour. I do get all the fun ones. So <laughs> all of the activities revolving around adding the robots in as, as supplemental help, I think it enhances everything that's happening and it's keeping the staff there able to lead either that game of Pictionary or that card game of Bridge. It's allowing the robot to be the service that's going into the kitchen and bringing out the wine or the beer or the snacks, do all of that legwork so that we can keep the staff there front and center, having a great time with the residents and, and leading any type of game that they're looking to do. So the robot is an essential part of just getting all of those mundane tasks done and out of the way. And this one really excites me because when I think about what I do for a living is how do we create that elevated experience for the residents in our community? And outside of the servers in the dining room, the resident engagement director is probably the most beloved person in a community. And that person being able to spend 50 minutes of a 60 minute happy hour versus 30 minutes, instead of pouring wine and and making sure we have food and run into the kitchen to get all that stuff, they are now leading Pictionary. They are now engaged fully with the residents and building those bonds. 
that's how you get a Gen Z resident engagement director to stay in place. They're finding value and purpose in that activity as opposed to, well, they're just a glorified catering manager, right? So very exciting stuff. So Betty is, I mean, she's living life in this community of the future, but it's dinner time. And so we talked about the variety of options and, um, you know, this is one of those things where there aren't robotics in place, but we do have technology and the thinking around a grab and go self-service cafe is really that um, it's options, right? This is something that's available to residents based on their active lifestyle. We've seen all of the various different um, activities that can, can happen in a community. And so Betty decides that instead of going to the dining room, she's got a, a really exciting activity coming up here in about 30 minutes. And so she wants to just grab her dinner and take it to her room. One fun statistic about this is there was a community uh, in the Northeast that they did a study of having these unmanned grab and go kiosk spaces. And the first question I asked after they described it was, how do you manage loss? That's got to be a huge cost factor in all of this. Well, they studied it actually as part of this. And what they found was the actual amount of loss from stolen products or product that'd be thrown out was less than what it would cost to man the station. So again, we're finding solutions in this community of the future to help us with staffing and also provide that elevated experience for our residents. We have a lot of software companies that are doing in-room TV software, like engagement software. And so the next step, obviously, is how can I engage with my loved one across the country or who can't make it in to see me today? And so this virtual dinner with the family, I've picked up my food, I'm going back in, and now I've got the software on my TV that's easy to use that lets my loved one dial in and we can have dinner together while I'm in my room talking to them. Sanjeev, I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about, as Betty's going to bed, she's wrapping things up for the night. She's closing up her windows and she looks out into the parking lot and she sees this robot of yours that's out there. Tell us what's going on here and what Betty's experiencing. So one of the things that our outdoor robot can do is uh, a security patrol. So basically ensuring that the residents are safe. Obviously in memory care, this could be a robot that ensures there's no wandering happening and that the buildings are secure. And if anything looks suspicious, this has a camera, it can take pictures or record the event or even call for help uh, if something looks out of place. So I call this the patrol robot <laughs> and it can be used uh, in and around the community. It can also deliver things. It's got a big screen on it and it actually comes with an app. So if you had, let's say, a craving for cheesecake at night, <laughs> it could pick up the cheesecake from the cafeteria and deliver it to you. Yeah. Late night snack. That's yeah. right. <laughs> exactly. So let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. So we're kind of in the end of the day, right? But it's almost a repeat of what we saw first thing in the morning for Betty. So Becky, tell us what this looks like. Yeah, this is where we kind of bring back in the appropriate lighting, the circadian rhythm. If you do want that late night snack, you're able to immediately order something and essentially the vitals too. And if there's an issue there, there's constant opportunities for someone to come in. And that really is all done through technology. And this is your winding down moment, but you're still monitored. You still have the availability of services. You still can quickly reach out to somebody and essentially be able to order something if you do need it. So it's really neat. And Sanjeev, I think that this is probably something that isn't considered or looked at as much from a technology standpoint, but how often would you say residents or communities are using things for kind of end of day and wrapping up all of those opportunities? I think it can be used a lot more. I think one of the, the areas that we could also leverage robotics is to sort of capture some data. What's happening in the room? What, what are some behaviors? I was in a session yesterday where people were arguing that behavioral data is more important than the data that's in your electronic health record. 
And that's playing a huge role in certain decisions that are being made, whether it's what you're eating, the pills that you're taking, whether it's the activity that you're engaged in. All of that data can now be captured and can be a data source that can uh, play into uh, decisions that are made, uh, whether it's to move you to a different level of living or whether it's if you're just sitting in your room all day and not being active, it could uh, trigger an alarm for someone. So there's a lot of possibilities here for not just what's happening throughout the day, but to actually capture data on uh, some of the behaviors that uh, may be taking place uh, within the community. And prospects and family, I think, can feel very reassured that blood pressure is monitored and being sent to TEMI CNA, your blood pressure is high. You have a remote assessment there that's constantly keeping watch. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that was, that's a great little segue here, right? Because so far we've painted the picture perfect day for Betty, right? Like there's not anything we know that that's not the norm, right? There's always going to be a hiccup here or there or something doesn't go right. And so we wanted to kind of finish the day with exactly what we just talked about. The You're wrapping things up for the day. You're getting those vitals checked in. All of a sudden, there's an issue. There's something that was found, like Becky, you mentioned blood pressure was high. So at 1135, right, we're talking almost immediate. You've got the capabilities of a nurse on call. And Sanjeev, I want you to talk a little bit about that. But I think from an operator's perspective, this becomes so key, right? Because one of the hardest to find positions right now in the workforce are those LPNs and RNs, the people that can address these issues. Um, and so having a service available like this, operators can now staff remote nursing nurses who can use this technology. They can get the vitals, they can remote in through a video call, and they can do a initial assessment for for this resident and they can be available to not just one community but multiple communities maybe they spend their day manning a desk in the office or at home and they're just taking calls when issues come up and so that's right and this becomes further exacerbated in independent living because you normally don't staff independent living with nurses correct so the idea is that a nurse can come in for like an e-call or a nurse call remotely and be in the room virtually and be able to assess the situation and call for additional help if needed. So let's say you have you know, an emergency call at 1.30 in the morning or 11.30 at night, a security guard could come uh, and attend to that resident and then the nurse could be there through the robot in the room with the security guard to assess the situation and see if it needs further escalation. So the role of the nurse kind of changes from an on-site nurse, third shift nurse to like a virtual nurse. So that's essentially the value that uh, these robots bring to that yeah. situation. Well, and think about the work-life balance for that nurse, right? Like mm -hmm. they may get no calls for an hour, right? And so now right. they can be at home taking care of some of those in-home things that they need to, to support their family. Right. Um, and they're still providing that critical service for not just one, but even multiple communities. So. So and this this goes back to you know the point about being having happy employees because you're giving yes. them flexibility, you know you're giving them shifts that they want. They're able to work remotely and come in virtually as needed, as opposed to being on site all the time. Absolutely. So, so, Sanji, Becky, this I mean this has been a great webinar, and we have quite a few questions that have come in. So, Becky, if you want to run through those, we can uh, get those yep. answered and and kind of wrap things up today. Yeah, there's some awesome questions. So how can robots assist with ADLs, particularly bathing, dressing, and changing of depends slash incontinence care? So we're looking into this. We don't have a robot at the moment that does bathing, and but we're looking into solutions that have arms that can lift residents, uh, that can place them in wheelchairs and the like. But uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're certainly looking into that. And I do think that that's an area that has a huge need for robotics. So we're certainly looking at that that area. Yeah, that makes sense. So the next one is in our dining area, drop, break. Is there an ROI there in terms of that? And then also workers' comp in terms of back issues, carrying heavy items, et cetera. Yeah, the great questions. You know, I'm going to start with the workers' comp piece because that's the really big ticket number, right? And so... 
the OSHA in March of this year, actually, they estimated that the average settlement cost from a back injury is between twenty and twenty-five thousand dollars, and it can even get up to as high as forty to eighty thousand dollars for a single incident. When you take into consideration medical bills, lost wages, benefits, all of those things, and so finding ways to use the robots and technology to eliminate some of those heavy-duty injury-prone tasks can really, I mean, there's a huge cost savings. I mean, that's that's another person for the full year just by saving that uh, number. And that's not even talking about the insurance rates. And so uh, definitely a huge piece there. Absolutely. So. So how far can the delivery robots go, Sanjeev? Someone saying, you know, to cottages that are, you know, feet away or miles away. They can go, I believe, up to two to three miles within a campus. I, I'd have to get the exact mileage, but uh, I want to say it's two miles. Uh, they they can go that far. Nice thing about having it in a community setting versus a city setting is that you don't need permits for them to go out on the road and cross roads and so on and so forth. But our robots can you know, not only go through all different trains, but uh, they go quite far. Can the robots transcribe the conversation during a visit or rounds in with the resident? They sure can. And we've actually built a note-taking app that helps nurses take notes and then push those notes up to the EHR so that that frees them up. If you look at a nurse's day, you know, 20 to 30% of their day is just doing administrative tasks. So we're helping give back that time to them. And one of those is note-taking and data entry, right? So we can certainly have the robots do the note-taking uh, Another question that I think is worth answering, uh, do the robots have to be plugged in by a human or do they automatically dock themselves? That's a great question. And this comes up a lot. So the nice thing about our robots is that they can auto dock. And uh, when it comes uh, specifically to cleaning, uh, they not only can go back and uh, refill the water, especially the, the, the scrubbers uh, with new water. Uh, so it's much like a washing machine, but it has to be hooked up close to a drain but they can also clean themselves and then go back out. So there's very little manual intervention when it comes to docking and when it's at the end of its round, uh, that actually makes it uh, less manual and more automated. And that's one of the uh, advantages that we have over some of the other products in the market. Yeah, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the questions coming in, and thank you to everyone for those, are really around you know the ROI and you know how to justify that so how do you measure success with a robot deployment you know what are those kpis that you're looking for so i think you know roi just gets you through the door right and we have very simple roi calculators to ensure that it justifies the cost of the robot because some of these aren't cheap uh, especially if you are buying them uh, outright uh, but i think the bigger kpi for me is usage and tasks performed and that's something that we can measure through the analytics that uh, the robot provides. So for instance, in dining, it may be trips back and forth to the kitchen. In terms of cleaning, it could be how many square feet does it clean in a day. In healthcare, it could be how many hours of a nurse's day is given back to her because she can do other value added tasks. So we have very clearly defined ROI templates that we work with each operator uh, based on their individual use cases. And we ensure that uh, there is a very clear path to ROI. And that's the only way to justify these robots. I think we can all sit here and say, this is so far out. This is 15 years out. But the reality is, is it's here, it's now. And there are a lot of opportunities and ways to implement robotics and technology. Aaron, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to sum up, but I know we're coming to the, the end of uh, our time here. If we didn't get to your question, what we'd love for you to do is... Take note of the contact information here for Sanjeev, Becky, myself. We'd love to try and answer more of your questions, help you get a better understanding of, of, of where you're at with this technology. As we showed with our community of the future, there is such a huge opportunity to create a, a, this high-tech, high-touch environment that I think will solve a lot of problems when you think about the workforce and the ser people we're serving. Well, Becky, that, that brings us to a close. So thank you for moderating and keeping us on task. 
Sanjeev, thank you for bringing that technical expertise and really painting this bigger, broader picture on why we need to really start developing and creating the community of the future.